In today's video, we're going to cover a low-cost managed switch from TP-Link. In my recent video on creating VLANs, I used some higher-end switches to do the configuration, but today we can walk through how you can do the same thing with a really low-cost managed switch. If you haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button and select notifications so you'll be notified when there's new content. One of the key components for creating VLANs and for customizing your network is a managed switch. Unfortunately, for home use, we often tend to buy unmanaged switches because of the cost. This switch from TP-Link actually does a nice blend of features at a very low cost, making it a really good choice for home use. So before we get into see how to set this up and cover the features, let's cover the hardware and what comes in the box. As you can see from the contents of the box, there's really not much in there. You get the switch itself. You get the um, brackets for rack mounting if you're going to rack mount this thing. If you are going to put it on the desktop, you get some little rubber feet and, of course, the rack mounted screws and a power cord. And that's pretty much all you get. As you can see from the hardware, this thing has 16 1 gigabit ports. All the ports support jumbo frames if you're using jumbo frames in your network. Some of the key features of the switch, um, it does have some cable diagnostics, which we'll get into when we get into the configuration. But the switch obviously supports VLANs, uh, QoS, link aggregation, which is kind of important if you're trying to get some extra performance out of your network. As you can see, besides the hardware ports that are located in front, you also get a reset switch, which allows you to re you know hard reset the device in case you get things really fouled up. And then you, of course, get the lights that tell you the link speed and that which ports are actually in use. If we take a look at the back of the switch, again, there's not much back here. You get the power plug and a ground connection for you to ground out the switch. This is a passive device, um, so there's no fans or of any type. You just get that vent that's in the back. So that's pretty much it for the hardware. Let's get into the setup and see how this thing works. Okay, so once you log into the device, you're greeted with the main web login page. And it kind of gives you an overview of of the device. So it gives you a device description, the MAC address, the IP address, subnet, gateway, firmware version, hardware version, etc. And uh, you can actually change the device description if you want. So drilling down a little further, we can see some IP settings. And this is the IP settings that you've established for the device itself. And you can use both a DHCP and a static. Um, I actually control everything through my firewall. So I leave it at DHCP and I can assign a static address through my firewall. The next option is to be able to turn the LEDs on and off. And then we have our user account, which is uh, the ability to change the admin password. And then under system tools, we got something that is critical to us. And the first one being backup and restore. This is something that you want to do once you get it working. You definitely want to back it up and know where you put that backup file. Because if you do play around, make changes, and you got to do a hard reset. This is uh, something you're going to need to be able to restore back to where you uh, started. Now, remember, this is a manual process, so you need to keep in control of this. So you'll have to back up when you're ready and, rest and know where you have your restore file. And you can do things like system reboot, system reset from here, and then, of course, the firmware update, which is always critical for security reasons. Under switching, we have um, our port settings. And we have our lag settings, which is our link aggregation. And we're going to get into that towards the end of the video. So under monitoring, you have your port statistics. And you have your cable test, which is kind of handy um, if you want to make sure that everything is working okay and that you want to get an idea of how long your cable is. So, for example, if I select port 1 and 2 and I hit apply, it's going to give me a test result and it's going to tell me the distance Loop prevention is basically enabled, and that's a feature to protect yourself from actually looping around within the switch. And then VLANs, which we'll get more into more detail here in just a little bit. And then, of course, you have the QoS, which we're not going to really get into, but these options are available. So you can do some quick bandwidth controls. You can do some quick settings, put some restrictions on certain ports. So you have a little bit of customizing and options that you can actually do. So let's dive a little deeper into VLANs. If you saw my last video on VLANs, then you know that separating your IoT devices from your main network is critically important. And VLANs is a great tool in which to do that from. During that video, I used a more expensive switch 
to show you how to accomplish that. So today I want to show you how you can do it with a low cost switch like the TP-Link, as VLANs will work on virtually any managed switch. So let's start by taking a look at the options that we have on this switch. We have a about four of them. So we have the MTU LAN, which is a multi-tenant unit, and we have the port-based VLAN. I'm not going to talk much about those. If you want to experiment with those, you can. I prefer to use the 802.1Q because it's more of an industry standard. Um, it's configured very similarly almost every switch, and it allows you a much greater amount of, of customization. One of the things I like to do is to segregate and label my VLANs according to the range. So if you look at, for example, the um, port-based VLAN, you're limited to VLANs 2 through 16 because you, you can't exceed the number of ports that you have on your switch. Whereas with 802.1Q, I can do things like make it 200, 300, 80, 40, this allows me to do um, a little bit more logical segregation. For example, I have my family network at a 192.168.40, and I have my IoT devices at 192.168.80. So again, we're going to focus on these two settings. So let's walk through how to do this real quick and how to create that VLAN in the switch. And again, for information on how to set up your firewall and how to set up your, you know, your other devices, you need to go look at my other video, which I'll post the link to, or, you know, take a look at your individual hardware to see how to set up a dedicated port in your router or a dedicated VLAN port in your router. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we need to identify the ports that we want to basically add to the VLAN. So in this case, we're going to create an IoT separation in this switch. So what I want to do is I'm going to create VLAN 80 to match the dot 80 on my firewall. And to do that, I'm going to basically, I have to include port one as the tag port, because that's my uplink. And I'm going to do 14, 15, and 16 will be assigned to VLAN 80. So I'm going to go ahead and hit add. And you can see down here it's done just that. But the only thing is, is that VLAN 1, I should have removed those last ports. So what I'm going to do is, VLAN 1, by the way, is the default. So I'm going to go down to 14, 15, and 16 and make them not members of VLAN 1. So I'm going to modify those. So now what you see down here is we have our default VLAN ID 1, which is your default ports for all traffic. And it's only working on ports 1 through 13. And then my VLAN 80 is working through ports 14 through 16, but it includes port 1 as an uplink. So now the last thing I have to do is go over the PVID settings, and I'm going to need to identify the ports that are basically part of the VLAN. So I'm going to say VLAN ID... 80, and I'm going to include port 14, 15, and 16. Hit apply, and there we see the, se the separation. So this basically defines my untagged ports. So port 1 through 13 is for all traffic. 14, 15, and 16 is dedicated to VLAN 80, which in my case will be a 192.168.80.xxx address. And that's all I got to do. So assuming I've done the other things that are listed in my other VLAN video, I've basically completed and set up a VLAN in this low-cost switch. So let's talk a little bit about link aggregation groups um, or lags. Basically what this does is allows you to group two or more ports and create a group which will be treated as a single port, which allows you to use them not only in VLANs, but allows you to get better performance from device to device as well as provide some redundancy. So if you got a couple of lines going to, say, your router or to your NAS and you're worried about something happening, you know, having a link aggregation group would supply two or more lines to that device. So it would give you that redundancy that you're looking for. So let's walk through setting one up real quick. It's extremely simple to do. So basically, you pick your group lag ID number. So we'll just use one as the default. And then we're going to go pick the ports that we want to use. In this case, it'll be 15 and 16. Hit apply. 
and basically it's created a lag group. So ports 15 and 16 will be treated um, as one port. And if you um, if your other devices support link, link aggregation groups, you could like your NAS, for example, you could create a couple, uh, an aggregation group in there as well. And basically almost double your bandwidth going to from your NAS to your network. And I also wanted to point out that once you do create an aggregation group, if you go over to VLAN, you'll see, and I go to create a VLAN, you'll see that ports 15 and 16 or lag one now show up. So if I was to uh, going back to assigning uh, VLAN 80, if I do a, a, assign VLAN 80, the minute I put untagged on one of those, they both get selected by default because they're treated as one. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, I'm going to be doing a future video on how to get the maximum performance from link aggregation groups and show you what the actual performance difference is. So overall, this is a great low-cost managed switch. I'm currently using two of them in my home network, and I've been really happy with them. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions on the device. And please don't forget to subscribe and click the notifications icon so you'll know about all the new content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.